Welcome back to the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Thanks so much for joining us on AtlantaFalcons.com, YouTube, Spotify, <laughs> iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. These guys are still trying to work out their mics and their volumes and their headsets here. So at this guy gets mad because I wave at people. What's this guy? He's, He's just saying hello. I know, right? right. DJ, Come go on, ahead. Feel me, right? DJ Shockley, go ahead. Say hello hey. to the folks joining us. Hi, people. Hey, yes. Hello. Dave, do you want to wave people. to him or you just want to say Dave, hello? Dave, wave. Or? Wave, Dave. <laughs> Cares what a shock wave to All right, well, <laughs> I'm angry. We got to get angry because we got Tampa this week. Yes, if you're not angry. You got to be ready. Oh, to roll well, them, kind of a little bit because I don't know if people are going to watch us if we're angry. But oh, okay. let's take that anger okay. and let's bring it to excitement Jim? and Jim? energy <laughs> and and true opinions. All right, here's the rundown of what we're going to talk about today. So far, we're going to go back and revisit the Jacksonville game. Talk a little bit about the Atlanta Falcons run the game. Switch it over, talk about the defense and some of the strides that they're making, some of the performance we're starting to see from that side of the ball. And then I will give Arch the uh, the carte blanche. I will give him the floor to get angry about the Buccaneers game coming Usa. up. No, no, go. it ain't time to woo saw. He well, said you, get you, angry. You, you told me to calm down, so I'm going to yeah. try to channel it till I need it. Okay. So, uh, so oh, that's, that's the plan. Wave it to people, will you? <laughs> All right, DJ, since you're in such a good mood, you got the smiles, you got the waves and everything. For sure. Put into perspective the Falcons' win over the Jaguars this past weekend. Is it one of those games where it was like, you know what, a win, I'm not going to take anything for granted, they needed to get it, or was it more like, you know what, we needed to win that game? That was a, an opponent that was not as good, not as talented as Atlanta, and they needed to get it. Where do you stand on the whole situation? Rack, I'm in the, I'm in the area of – both. I think you needed to win, but also it was a game that uh, I know a lot of people are expected you to win. And, uh, you know, I, I went back and forth with the guy on Twitter who said, ah, shock, don't get too excited. This is the Jaguars. And I'm like, guess what? These dudes get paid just like everybody else. This is the National Football League, and these guys are, you know, the best of the best. Yeah, they're having a, a not-so-good season, but these guys are here for a reason. And at any given week, a team can beat you. We talked about it last week. The same Buffalo Bills team came down there and lost 9-6. to six. So, yeah. this is a team that, obviously, if they put it all together and don't have some of the mistakes they had versus us, they can win ball games. So, I'm on the thing of this was a good win. It was a win you needed. You went on the road again where you played really well. Yeah. But this was a win that you needed and you had to have if you were looking towards the future. And this team won't ever say it. We always talk about, yeah, you one game at a time. But – if you want to get to what a, your goal is, which is to play in the postseason, you got to win these type of ball games. You can't let these ball games slip by the wayside. We saw that earlier with like Washington. You should have won that ball game, Philly at the beginning of the year. I mean, there's certain ball games you look at and say you should have won those games, but you didn't. And this was one of those type of games. I can't sit here and say that the guy that was arguing with you on Twitter is wrong either, because the Falcons are not a complete polished product themselves right however to your point and we all know this as former players that any week you win in the nfl is a good week no doubt. because there are pros on the other side of the ball there's really good players on that team as well are they not clicking on all cylinders right now sure i think that's fair they're shooting themselves in the foot a lot of penalties are hurting the jaguars right now but dave you got a chance to call the action what differences did you see did you see a different mentality from the falcons what was the difference in them getting off to the lead and then holding on to the lead at the end yeah by the way javiel probably was saying the same thing about us <laughs> when we well this is a win you this is a game you gotta have you gotta <laughs> yeah, win yeah. this game right so that's just the way it is in this league you have you certainly feel like you have advantages here and there they were decidedly challenged this week to to play more physical at the line of scrimmage. They had gotten beaten up on the line of scrimmage on the offensive side of the football. The challenge was, can we play on another team's side of the line of scrimmage? You guys have heard it all. We've all sat in offensive meetings. We need to reestablish the line of scrimmage on their side of the line of scrimmage. Yes. You saw it the entire day. You had 149 yards rushing. Cordero Patterson was the featured guy in that, but you still ran the ball with success. That's the backbone of what Arthur Smith wants to do. He wants to come downhill at you and run the football. I thought in, in your rotated centers, there, there, was, there was a decided idea there saying, hey, Matt Hennessy, we, we like you. We like you as a player. Got to play better. Mm -hmm. We're going to give Drew Dahlman an opportunity to step in there and see if he can play. You know, and he did. And they both were pretty good. Both of them played well. And I thought the four guys around them did a good job. Tight ends, throw all those guys in. Run game was outstanding. I thought the uh, physical part of the game from an offensive standpoint was the part that, to me, just bled into the broadcast. Just, just came out at you, wow, we're, what is this? Coming off the ball, you're up on the second level. You're getting safeties blocks. Guys are running through. The touchdown run Cordell Patterson has from the 10, he walks in. I mean, 
where is that? You know, what, yes. what's that been? So, so that to me is something that you try to carry forward because you have not seen that certainly in the last couple of weeks. And I don't know you'd seen it for a long time. What did you say? It's been several several uh, games yeah. since Atlanta was put a guy over 22 games, yards. I believe yeah. it was, since the last time Atlanta had a 100-yard rusher talking about an individual player not rushing mm -hmm. for over 100 yards as a team. And, Dave, there's no surprise, no getting around it. Let me come right back to you. Cordero Patterson was a big part of that run game. We knew this a week ago when he was out of the lineup that that was going to be something that was going to hurt Atlanta. He's been the most consistent playmaker this year. And it's interesting that you talk about the physicality, Dave, because there was one run that Cordero Patterson took around the left side and a corner came up to try to tackle him. And CP ran right over the top of him. Yeah. And I was showing my wife and I was like, that's the physicality that they need to play with the rest of the season. So I think it's great that you talk about the physicality, not just up on the offensive line, but Cordero Patterson was running with physicality. He seemingly does that all year. But what other differences did you see in the run game that gave them so much success? Well, it, first of all, it's playing on the other team's side of the line of scrimmage. I mean, when you've got to make people miss in your backfield, it makes it difficult. The thing that I loved about it is Cordero Patterson's not a cutback runner. He is the perfect fit to what Arthur Smith wants to do. Go watch some of the film of Derrick Henry. It's stretch, boom, hit him one shot. But when you push the line of scrimmage and you play on the other team's side of the line of scrimmage now, reestablish that line of scrimmage two or three yards down the field, you naturally slide into cutback lanes, and Cordero can do that. That's what he did in the game where he slid back into those holes as opposed to having to put your foot in the ground or jump cut back into a cutback. They were playing with that physicality that provided those other lanes to run the football. Um, Cordero Patterson the, the, is the MVP of this football team right now, it, and it probably will be for the rest of the year if he can continue to play. One thing to point out about him, he took a shot low. The safety came over. And I thought it was a church, I thought it was a dirty shot. The guy took a shot at his ankles. He was just stepping out of bounds, yep. and he dove into his ankles. Don't think that that dude didn't know that Cordero Patterson sat last week with an ankle injury. Yeah. He took a shot to try to get him out of the game. We talk all the time that players don't want to knock guys out of the game. You don't want to hurt other guys. You want to. But I thought that was a I thought that was a dirty play. Cordero jumped up, limped off the field, and got back in the football game. Gave him credit. That bothered me. Uh, it was just something I needed to point out that I thought he was trying to take Cordero out of the game. Cordero, six foot two, six three, two hundred and twenty five pounds, and he brings that load. You just talked about out on the edge. He ran through a couple of other players. If you try to arm tackle this dude, it's a no go, because I did an interview with him post game. I had no idea how big the dude was. <laughs> why you didn't put? Couple, why, why you didn't put your shades on? He had his shades on. You should have rocked well, your shades he, yeah, too. Yeah, but he, it's yeah. his. It's his show. It's his, it's his deal. <laughs> I'm just Dave's I'm just along for the ride, DJ. I'm, I'm just a conduit to get him out there. You know? So you know, no, he was he was outstanding in the game. And to me, he's been the MVP, no question. Yeah, I think it's great the points that you're making because there's been too often where they're trying to run the football. Matt turns around, hands the ball off, or maybe it's out of the shotgun, hands the ball off, and it's got to stop the feet right away, right? But when you get Cordero Patterson, DJ, to go downhill, get him up to full speed, and then give him multiple lanes oh, on where really. he can go, yeah. now that's trouble for the defense, is it not? Rick, I think you're reading my brain right now because <laughs> I have the perfect Dangerous example. Place. Dangerous but, place to go. <laughs> it's a great place to be, Dave. Great place. <laughs> I ain't going to lie. But uh, I did a breakdown on LandonFalcons.com talking about the exact thing that you just talked about. And aren't you remember this? It's early in the first quarter. And they bring Kyle Pitts over, and then here comes Keith Smith on a motion, and he gets a running start, and he's downhill on the defensive end. You can see the tight end get up on the next linebacker. You see the guard and tackle work together to get up on the linebacker. And he has a two-way go. Mm -hmm. It's a run for about 19 yards off the left side. And he has a two-way go, and the linebacker's sitting right in the gap, but he doesn't know which way to go. And they do a good job of sealing, good job of getting his head on the right side. And he has a two-way go. He ends up hitting it on the left side, and nobody touches him. The safe doesn't touch him until he gets 15 yards down the field. This is exactly what Archie talked about, the physicality up front, getting to the second level, and then having a guy like Cordell Patterson who can pick and choose. How many times have we had an opportunity to say he had a two-way go yes. in the run game yes. and not have to falter and stutter his feet? Having a two-way go, that physicality up front, and on that particular play, offensive line, tight end, receivers all blocking in unison together and it created a really nice run play in the run game and then you couple that with the creativity that Arthur Smith had to first bring over pitch where now he has leverage now you bring the motion and now he has leverage on the defensive end to to crash him and put push him out of the play it's all coming together it's there you just have to have the execution
It's interesting. I, you, you know, real quickly on Cordero Patterson. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's been phenomenal what they've been able to do with this guy, right? It's It's been amazing the versatility he brings to the table. He's always been that guy, versatile. Yeah. Came in the league as a receiver, kickoff returner, number one draft pick, Vikings. He was a guy that was going to explode. And really never came together. Nobody really could figure out what to do. Give Dave Ragone and Arthur Smith a ton of credit for finding this guy's niche as to how you use him. 16 carries, that was a career high for him in this game. He had a career high, 108 yards rushing. But they find a way to get him to touch the ball like 20 times in the yep. game. Yep. And kickoff returns are a part of that. They did not have him return kickoffs in this game to preserve him. I think he had a couple of catches in the game as well. But this is a guy that's been in the league for a little while, and no one's been able to unlock the Cordero Patterson code. That we're seeing this year. Give Dave Ragone and Arthur Smith credit for fine. This guy was a number one draft pick. And they've just now figured out, this staff figured out how to use this guy. Yeah, and it's uh, it's interesting too, Shock. You mentioned Keith Smith. I, I think there was an old there was an old school fullback lead ISO block mm-hmm. that he squared somebody up down on the goal line. Miles Jack. I think. Yeah, yeah, and it was that was beautiful. You don't see that a whole lot because teams don't have fullbacks anymore. Might have been a touchdown necessary. run he had. I think there. it was where he yeah, wasn't yeah. even touched. I mean, yeah. t- you talk about squaring somebody up. That was beautiful. Kind of re- brings me back to the old Bob Christian yeah. days. Yeah, remember <laughs> that, Dave? Cool. All right, so that's kind of the run game for Atlanta. Obviously, that gave him a big advantage in that game allowed him to get off to a fast start let's switch it over to the other side of the ball defense continues to make some strides again and Dave I'm gonna I'm gonna serve this one up to you because I want you to just tell us what impressed you most about the defense I don't want to single you out put you down a road with a certain player or a certain style but as you're watching the game as you're calling the game and you're seeing these guys go out and make plays some interceptions some sacks what is the most impressive to you that they need to replicate for the rest of the season? Well, I think taking away the explosive plays is number one. They gave up five plays of 15 yards or more. That might be a play or two more than you would like, Mm -hmm. but five plays is near the low end of what they've done this year. They continue to get better at that, but it's got to be take the ball away. You you have to take the football away. If you go to all the games this, this weekend in the NFL and just go look who won the giveaway takeaway ratio, that team, the team that had more takeaways, lost. You had a team in Tennessee that ran for 270 yards in a game, and they lost because they turned it over five times or four mm-hmm. times in the game. That's what happened in this game. Atlanta got a turnover deep in their own end, took away a playing a scoring opportunity, yep. and then got the fumble that provided a scoring opportunity. Two big takeaways. To me, that we're starting to see them get the ball out a little bit more. We saw A.J. Terrell's interception uh, against New England. We're seeing a little bit more of that. I think that's something they're improving on. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, Find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. So the takeaways, Fowler starting to, to become a pass rusher that I think he needs to be on a consistent basis. And again, DJ, the, maybe the more impressive thing is having this performance without one of the best leaders on that defense in Deion Jones. What stuck out to you the most defensively for Atlanta? Well, let's start there. I, I felt Michael Walker stepping into Deion Jones' spot was huge. Knowing that he had to come in here on you know he, he's played throughout the year but not to step in that void and say okay now I have to be the guy that fills that role that's a big role to fill for a guy and he comes in and he's the leading tackler in the ball game I mean that's big yeah he got a couple missed tackles here and there but the guy played pretty solid in there uh, in that spot the other thing I want to talk about is I thought this defense played really good in the situational parts of the ball game you're talking about they were 0 for 2 the Jaguars were on fourth down they were really good. They were one for three in the red zone. So those situations of the game matter. Those are game. Those are situations where teams go down and they win ball games because maybe they convert a fourth down and you go down and score, or you score in the red zone. We know how important that is. Uh, the other part of it is I want to give Grady Jarrett his flowers. I mean, yeah. come on, this, this dude. Every week we expect him to be that guy. How many games have we seen him cause holding penalties? How yes. many times have we seen him in the backfield just swim or beat a guy and? causes a negative yardage play. How many times he forces a quarterback to move off his spot right in the middle? Grady continues to be the guy in the middle that comes to play every single week. 
and we can't take that for granted. He is that kind of player every single week. So I enjoy watching Grady <laughs> every single week because he's going to give you four or five plays in a ball game that is just him. That he's going to win, he's going to beat the guy in front of him and cause a negative yardage play and win at the point of attacking. Arch talked about it winning the line of scrimmage. That is a big part of it. He is a big part of why teams want to go outside because they know that guy is stout on the inside and he calls at least two or three holding penalties throughout the game. And there's a number of them that they don't call. So yeah. he continues to be the guy like that. First and goal at the six gets yeah. penetration, holding, call. holding penalty, they get, just yeah. completely kills the drive for right. Jacksonville. I mean, those are the things that you're right, DJ. They don't really go in the stat sheet, right. but they're they're extremely important to the success of a defense is some of those plays that go unnoticed. And I think it's interesting, Dante Fowler, you've talked about this before, DJ. Do your 111th, yeah. right? Sometimes – when you're having a struggling season, guys try to do more. Dante Fowler, after the game, says, I think we're just starting to play together as a unit and doing our jobs. Everybody do their own job, not do something special, just doing what we're supposed to and do it 100%. So now we're starting to hear from the players the things that need to happen. You don't have to try to play both defensive ends. Right. Just play your defensive end <laughs> position and do it well and do it to 100%. All right, Dave, so let's let's take a step forward because the Buccaneers back on the schedule for Atlanta. We know how that one went the last time, 48-25 loss. You talked about turnovers on mm -hmm. defense. You talked about red zone defense. Those probably are two of the more telling stats in a football game that's going to create wins or losses. I know it's easy, Dave, to just say they need to take away the ball from Tom Brady, but Tom Brady's one of the best in the business as far as getting the ball out of his hands. But keys this time around, what can Atlanta learn from the last game against Tampa they can correct on this one to try to knock him down? Well, first of all, you got to know you can play with him. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. This was a game where you turned the ball over three times and they directly – two of them returned for touchdowns. Don't turn the football over. We get back <laughs> to that scenario right there. This game was 28-25 after Atlanta clawed the, their way back into the football game, down 20, 28 to 10, they claw their way back into it. As we turn to the third, fourth quarter, the score is 28-25 against the Super Bowl champs in week two. So you can play with them. There's no question about that. They look a little different now than they did in week two, and their running game has become more prominent. Yeah. Leonard Fournette's coming off a 100-yard game. He's also affected. He has become their Cordero Patterson. Yes. He's catching the ball in the backfield. He's running it. He accounted for about 150 yards this weekend, and I think he had four touchdowns yeah. this weekend against Indianapolis. But what did Indianapolis do? They turned the ball over. Yeah. Five turnovers, I believe, in that game against uh, against the Tampa Bay Bucks. This is a Tampa Bay Bucks team. It's still number one in the league against the run, so they're going to make it tough on you. You just you can't provide them short opportunities and or extra possessions. Don't give them 12 possessions in the game. Make them have 10. Make them have nine possessions. I think you're going to like what it looks like in the fourth quarter with a chance to win the game. Yeah, and this is one of those games, guys, where – We've been talking about the offensive line for Atlanta all season long, but they have to show up in this game because the front six or seven for Tampa Bay may be one of the better front six or sevens in the National Football League with the athletes and the playmakers that they have. So, DJ, sometimes when you talk about keys to a game, don't turn it over seems really elementary. Is there anything else that sticks out to you they're going to have to do in this game if they're going to knock off Tom Brady and company? I think the number one thing is you got to be able to stop the run. I mean, that's a – I think that's the most glaring thing because we've talked about the last couple of weeks. Brady's going to find a way with that cast of characters to do what he's supposed to do. They're going to throw the football around. They're going to make plays. But also you go back and you, and you say that's where their team has really grown is in the run game, like you just mentioned with Leonard Fournette. That is demoralizing for a defense if you're able to go down and throw it for 250, 300 yards and they got all these cast of characters making plays, but also you turn around and they're gashing you for six, seven yards a run. That's not going to be uh, good football if you're uh, the, the Atlanta Falcons. I, I think that's part of it is stopping that run, uh, having the ability to maybe get them off the field and not allow them to have those extended drives where it comes with you with them running the football and, and being big in this ballgame. I mean, the Colts went up and down the field on them mm -hmm. in this past ballgame. I mean, they rushed for over five yards of carry in the ballgame. I know, you know, Jonathan Taylor's a good back, but that's capable – with the Falcons as well. We just saw it this past week. If you put all the right pieces together, you can run the rock too. So I think that's part of it as well is you got to make sure if they are scoring touchdowns, you have to score touchdowns. Oh, yeah. That's the big part of it. There's been so many times where 
we've matched with field goals or they've scored touchdowns and we come down and we get a field goal. That's not going to be winning formula. You have to be good in the red zone if you want to beat a team like the Bucks. Yeah, and they're an explo- They're an offense that feeds on explosive plays. I'm talking about 15 yards or more. You go back to last, the last time the Falcons played, discount the turnovers and all that. They had nine plays of 15 yards or more. Atlanta, I think, had six, five or six in the game. You go back to the game in December a year ago, the team that won the Super Bowl trailed Atlanta 17 to nothing at mm-hmm. halftime. Atlanta lost that football game 31-27, if you guys remember. They had no plays of 15 yards or more in the first half. They had nine in the second half. Yeah. You, It's Mike Evans. It's Godwin. It's Fournette. Got the Gronk expl- back now. Yeah. The explosives, yeah. And, and obviously Gronk down in the red zone. Gronk had over 100 yards this weekend receiving as he's back on the field. And he had two touchdown receptions against the Falcons last time they played down in the red zone. But I really think that if you can limit how many times they touch it, obviously, and that's easier said than done, but limit the – make them earn it. Make them put seven, eight, ten plays together as opposed to four-play drives, five-play drives. Yeah, they're going to continue to ride Leonard Fournette for how productive that he has been. But just know that the play action is coming off of it, yeah. and one thing that Tom Brady does not do is hold on to the football. So, yeah. yes, you can't get too antsy biting on routes because he will take you over the top. But understand, for the most part, that the ball is coming out with him. He's going to throw a quick slant. He's going to throw a comeback, and he – Maybe more than any quarterback in this league understands what timing is getting the football out of his hands. One thing that the Falcons don't have to worry about, and they even got burned a little bit last week with Trevor Lawrence, is quarterback run has hurt them throughout Mm. the year. That's not going to be the case, okay? Tom Brady's not running with the football. So they got to make sure you slow down Leonard Fournette and then make those plays in the passing game to limit the explosives. Another thing you have to get back to in this game, and you said all hands on deck, you got to play a good football game this weekend. You can't just flop around and make mistakes and then hope to have a chance to win at the end. You're going to have to play pretty clean in this football game, maybe their best 60 minutes of the year. Um, Mike uh, Kyle Pitts has got to be a, pl- a part of the, the game plan. Yeah. You go back six games ago when against Miami at seven grabs for 160 yards. The last three, last five games, he has 14 catches for 190 yards. You factor that in five. Ca- that's less than three catches a game. And Matt missed him a couple times this game. Mm-hmm. Matt didn't have his best game mm-hmm. this weekend. Yet you were able to run it. Played solid defense, took the football away, and won a game. That's not going to be good enough this weekend. Matt's going to have to have a cleaner game, and he's going to have to get Kyle Pitts the football when he's open because there were a couple plays where he missed him this weekend. And I even remember hearing on the television broadcast, no offense, Dave, sorry, I was watching on television, (laughs) but (laughs) it was late in the game when he got his first touch. So to your point, I feel like they need to get the ball in his hands early, like get him the confidence, get Matt the confidence, and then all of a sudden the big fella is going to start creating some windows. But you're right. It is something the opposing defenses are going to try to slow down, just like Gronk being back on the field for the Bucks. Kyle Pitts is probably going to be the first scenario that most defenses are going to try to slow down in Atlanta's passing game. You just got to be better. Very you got to find a way to get off contact. You got to find a way to create separation, get open, show that jersey back to number two, and let him hit you. So that's kind of our thoughts on last week. That's our thoughts on this week. Let us know. Send us a message. Do they even Holler still do us. that these days? Wave at us. Wave at us. Wave at us. Wave at Dave. Make sure you, yeah. you hit. Shock's big in the waving. Dave, Archer QB uh, 16 on, on Twitter. Let just wanted know. to let you know I'm proud of you. You didn't get angry uh, at the people I with our team. Yeah. Yeah. You said you were against that. I did the Russo. <laughs> That took the boots off for you to calm down. Out of Bad Boys too, man. Yeah. <laughs> One of my Mark favorite Lawrence. movies of all times. Uh-huh. That's going to do it, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here on Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. Again, joining us on however you find your podcast, <laughs> AtlantaFalcons.com, Spotify, YouTube, Tastes and waiting. iTunes. We'll be back next week, and I'm going to get a wave in there, there as we well. Go. Take care, everybody.